Get ready. Hello and welcome to GameSack. This week we're going to take a look at an amazing game called Afterburner. It's by Sega. <laughs> oh, come on, Dan. Afterburner is not that amazing. I mean, how do you expect our viewers to sit through a whole episode based on Afterburner? Oh, I think they will. I don't think they will. Oh, they will. How can you not like a game where you fly around and shoot stuff? Why well, I do. I love games like that, but this one just isn't that engaging. Oh, yes it is. Come on, let's fire our Afterburners and get right to it. In 1987, Sega released an arcade game called Afterburner. It's a game where you fly an F-14 Tomcat around and shoot down other planes while at the same time attempting to stay alive. You've got a Vulcan gun and a limited supply of missiles which can be replenished at the beginning of certain stages. Hey Joe, is the Vulcan gun on loan from Spock? No, be quiet. Anyway, the game has 18 stages and it's designed to eat as many quarters as possible. That means you will die a lot. The goal of this game isn't necessarily to defeat the enemy, but simply to survive throughout all of the stages. I guess you consider blowing up the enemy's ground radio base as the main objective. Wow, that's really exciting. That same year, Sega released Afterburner 2. Now, what the hell is the difference between Afterburner and Afterburner 2, you ask? Actually, I didn't. Well, for one, the title screen now has a bunch of little balls that spin around. Also, instead of 18 stages, there are now 23 in all. I guess they had to add more stages since, you know, they're all only about 25 seconds each. Some of the stages have been changed slightly. Stage 3 in Afterburner 1 is kind of a grayish overcast stage, whereas the same stage in Afterburner 2 is nighttime. Also added were cool scenes where you can land at a base and get your weapons replenished, and a motorcycle from Hang On or even a Ferrari from Outrun zooms by. They also added a throttle so you can slow down or even turn on the afterburner for some super fast speed. This is needed because now the missiles in the enemy aircraft can sneak up right behind you. I usually play with the throttle on full blast just so I can get through the game more quickly. They also beefed up some of the music. Here's Afterburner 1. And here's the same tune from Afterburner 2. Overall, Afterburner 2 is the better game, but it's definitely not a sequel. It's more like some nice DLC or something like that. So Joe, does that mean the home console versions of the game are based on Afterburner or Afterburner 2, depending on the title screen? Well, yes and no. Actually, some of them have features from both versions. Ah, huh, jeez. Thanks, Sega, for making it so ambiguous and confusing. Well, it's not like you care anyway, though you should. Well, it's not that, you know. It's like I've said, Afterburner just isn't that exciting to me. Well, these home console translations I'm about to show you are exciting. Come on, let's take a look. Oh. Afterburner was first ported to the Sega Master System. This was a huge deal back in the day because it was the first console game in the US to have 4 mega power. This in itself was absolutely stunning. Wow. Now just what about this game required it to have that much memory? You know, that's a good question Dave. I'm not entirely sure. The port itself is a tad disappointing even for its time, but it's not horrible. The full screen barrel roll is here, but the voices are all gone. There is also no speed throttle. Also gone are the stages in which you attack the ground radio bases. But the refueling plane is still here and the landing stages from Afterburner 2 have been included as well. The music also features the extra melodies which isn't usually present in the arcade versions. Uh, what do you mean by extra melodies? There are actually two different versions of the Afterburner music. One featuring just rhythm, like so. and the other featuring a lead melody on top of that, like this.
Now both of them sound pretty good, but personally I like the tunes better with the lead melody intact and the Master System version has them. This version of the game is also unique in that it has actual bosses that you need to defeat every now and again. The NES version was released in the US by Tangen, or Tangen, whatever. As you can see, it's pretty crappy compared to the Master System version. Uh, I don't know about that, Joe. It's, it's not like the Master System was a killer app or something. Yeah, well, it does feature the barrel roll, surprisingly. This version is also very difficult and slow. The music is pretty good for the NES, but it doesn't feature the lead melodies. You can throttle the speed with the start button. Overall, this is fairly bland, I think. Yeah, it is, but they did it in less than 4 mega power. There is also a Japanese only version for the Famicom by Sunsoft and it's based on Afterburner 2. Some of the graphics are slightly different and the music is slightly beefed up with better percussion, but you can tell that this is still the same basic program at its core. Still, it does have the voices that the Master System and the US NES versions are sorely missing and is still less than 4 megs. Where is the memory going in the Master System version, Joe? I wish I had an answer for you, Dave. I really do. You can still throttle the speed with the start button here. Unfortunately, this one seems even harder than Tangan's US version. The PC Engine version of Afterburner 2 was also only released in Japan, and sadly it never came to the US for the TurboGrafx-16. NEC clearly knew what they were doing when bringing games to the US market. Okay, maybe not, but leaving this game in Japan was probably a wise move. Yeah, anyway, this version seems like the programmers had a bit of passion for the project. For example, both the aircraft carrier as well as the refueling plane have some fake scaling and they definitely could have gotten away without doing this. Also, there was a 3D room where he could spin the balls around because they were pretty proud of that. The gameplay is pretty well done for the most part. The voices are here, but they don't sound very good. The music is great with the lead melodies intact. The speed throttle is here and it's mapped to the run button. Ooh, a good use for my slow motion joystick. It can be kind of tough, but it's not overbearing. Overall, it's a pretty good port. A Genesis version of Afterburner 2 was programmed by Dempa. It's certainly not a bad game, but I think it could probably be better. Well, there's going to be a lot of hate thrown my way, but I think all Afterburner games could be better. All of the voices are here, but the lead melodies aren't. But the music is still pretty good. The fake scaling of the planes and the other stuff, it's all done rather well, but the ground texture seems kind of weird and it doesn't really move in relation to the objects that are on the ground. But what really chaps my ass is that they took out the landing sequences and replaced them with extra refueling planes. What really chaps my ass, Joe, is that the gameplay seems random and unfocused, just like all other Afterburner games. Yeah, but mostly it's fairly faithful to the Afterburner arcade. After the 32X had been out a while, Sega finally gave us Afterburner. Well, the box simply says Afterburner, but the title screen says Afterburner 2 Complete. This version is awesome and it's as close to the arcade as you're going to get on a cartridge. At first glance you might think it's exactly like the arcade version in every way, but there are some subtle differences. Firstly, the frame rate is 30 frames per second here as opposed to 60, not like YouTube can show this though. Also, the scaled objects are slightly lower resolution, meaning they get a bit more blocky when scaled than they do in the arcade. Still, it's pretty damn impressive and the sound is arcade perfect. That's right, no melodies. Still a near perfect port of Afterburner 2. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Afterburners, as you can see, but sadly this is still probably one of the best games for the 32X. And take that as you will. Afterburner on the Game Boy Advance is part of a game called Sega Arcade Gallery. It's fairly impressive at first, especially the sound. 
It's not full of the static that one is used to hearing on GBA games. This game is clearly based on Afterburner 1. Yes, clearly. However, it's even slower and the stages take forever to complete. There's no speed throttle at all and the speed is set to super slow. This game is an absolute nightmare. Yeah, it can get quite tedious, but what do you expect from a game released by THQ? The Sega Saturn version of Afterburner 2 is pretty much identical to the arcade. You know, I can't really see any area which it isn't. What's awesome about this version is that you can play it with the mission stick and that really helps it feel like you're playing the arcade version. Now if only my entire room would roll around with it. As far as Afterburner 2 goes, it doesn't really get much better than this. Well, it does if you play one of the different games on this disc. Yeah, the version in Japan is sold on a disc by itself and features music with and without the lead melody. But the version released in the US on the Sega Ages disc with two other games has the extra music removed. It was released here by Working Designs. I'm glad they included OutRun and Space Harrier on the disc, otherwise this would have been a rather boring release. Personally, I think the US Sega Ages release should have been a three disc set so each game could have had all the extras. Afterburner 2 was released on the Sega Dreamcast as an arcade game within Shenmue 2 and also on the Yu Suzuki Gameworks Volume 1. But only Volume 1, so don't get any of those other volumes of which there are about none. The version is exactly the same whether you play it in Shenmue 2 or Yu Suzuki Gameworks. Anyway, this version seems emulated instead of ported and it's pretty much exactly like the arcade. It has a glitch here and there and the music is slightly different. Same tunes, it's just that the instruments used is a little different for some reason. If all you have is a Dreamcast, it'll do. Sega redid Afterburner 2 on the PlayStation 2 under the 3D Ages banner. Basically what they do is take games that look fine and redo them with the ugliest 3D polygons you have ever seen. They make Nintendo 64 games look good. This game is no exception. It does play just like Afterburner 2 for the most part, but it just looks incredibly bad and bland. <laughs> so they took the only good thing about the game and made it much worse? Well, the music is just like the arcade. No arranged versions are here, unfortunately. It was released in Japan only, and it's definitely not worth tracking down unless you can get it really, really cheap. Or if some guy pays you to take it. All right, Joe, we kicked our afterburners in and we're done with this episode. Can I play OutRun now? Well, with Afterburner and Afterburner 2, yes, we're done. So you're saying there's an Afterburner 3? Mm -hmm. And let me guess, there's a few new stages and some maybe some new music, but other than that, it's the same game, right? I actually know. Uh, Want to take a look? Well, if the paychecks keep coming, yeah, I'll take a look. Oh, we do this for free for our fans, my friend. Let's take a look. In 1993, CRI programmed a game called Afterburner 3 for the Sega CD. Why they call it Afterburner, I have no idea. It's basically a Sega CD port of another Sega arcade airplane game called G-Lock. G-Lock never really had the intensity of a real Afterburner game. Anyway, as you can see, the ground is very sparse and undetailed. You also have a giant box around your plane and it just doesn't control tremendously well. The game has an amazing soundtrack though. It was taken from the FM Towns version and reused in this game. It even has lead melodies. Afterburner music really doesn't get much better than this. The only part about the soundtrack that I don't really like is the brass section. It just seems kind of inappropriate for such a rocking musical score. Get ready to raise the roof when you attack the enemy's ground bases. That's right, it's nightclub in time, yo. Still, this game is a rather sad effort and seems kind of broken as if Sega no longer took Afterburner seriously. Find it cheap, maybe pick it up just for the music.
In 2007, Sega released Afterburner Black Falcon for the Sony PSP. The game was made by Westerners and it doesn't really have anything to do with Afterburner other than the name. The stages are all mission based, meaning that you have a set of objectives that you need to accomplish. The stages can be really long as well. You earn cash so that you can buy new planes and new weapons. I guess the government doesn't want to help you out here and makes you buy all your own stuff to accomplish their mission. What the hell? I kind of like how this game is structured around missions and acquiring new planes, upgrade weapons, and even crazy new paint jobs. It's not an amazing game or anything, but it does help give Afterburner some substance, you know? The game has a few cutscenes here and there. Just like in real life, all female flight suits are designed to show cleavage. Hey, I'm not complaining here. The graphics are okay, but the music is average with only one or two decent tunes. Probably not worth losing any sleep over if it isn't in your collection, but it's certainly not horrible. Afterburner Climax. In 2006, Sega released Afterburner Climax to the arcades. <laughs> you said Climax. I saw it once, but it was $5 to play a single game. I declined. Instead, I waited until 2010 and bought the game for the PlayStation 3 for $10. I played it more than twice, so I definitely came out ahead in that deal. The game is a true sequel to Afterburner. It's fast, furious, and full of excitement. Well, I don't know about that, but it is kind of cool, at least at first. It is a bit easy, but that's okay, I suppose. There is a ton of radio chatter in this game. I'm not sure who thought that would be a good idea, and it's incredibly annoying. Let's just turn that off. There we go. So much better. Good going. Now I feel so lonely as I fly around blowing everything up. The game has a climax feature which you can use to slow down time and lock your missiles onto as many enemies as you can see. I don't like using it because it disrupts the fast paced flow of the game. Plus, it's, it's not really necessary. If you're not interested in climaxing, why even play the game? Uh, anyway, the new music here is pretty good, but you can even choose the original music but without the lead melodies. You can unlock lots and lots of stuff that will give you tremendous amounts of power and make the game a cakewalk. The graphics are awesome in motion and you can do a barrel roll pretty much anytime you want except for a few mission based stages. You can also choose your path here and there just like an outrun. Worth $10? Absolutely. Well, maybe if it were on sale for maybe $2.99 or $3.99 maybe I'd buy it. And that's all of the afterburners for you. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I gotta say I enjoyed it for about two minutes, but ultimately I just really wanna play something else. Well, maybe if you didn't have the attention span of a gnat, it might help. What do you say stuff like that for? That's just uncalled for, Joe. Say what? See, you can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember how you like uh, playing uncomplex games with, you know, no sense of purpose. Anyway, we'll be back next week when we take a look at another Sega arcade game. That's right, OutRun. All right, I love OutRun. That's going to be an awesome episode. You know, Joe, I've always loved your Afterburner poster. Even in high school, I love that thing, man. It's so awesome. I love looking at that poster even more than I like playing the damn game.